Hello, this is John Spielman with my latest um, agony column, or not so much agony anymore, my latest column. Let's move from the silly screen. That was just to check so I could check that it was on. And this, I've called this one The Anatomy of Match Play. And of course it is regarding the World Championship match, which if you're viewing this, this column comes out on Sunday, April the 2nd. And game one of the match will be in Astana at 2 p.m. Astana time, time in Kazakhstan, which in fact is 10 a.m. in London, 11 a.m. in, I don't know, Germany, France, West, in Western Europe, um, 9, 9 o'clock GMT and 5 o'clock in New York and earlier on the West Coast of America. So, um, so it's very, it's very, it's coming very soon, and obviously it will be the only story in town for a bit. I mean, other things will be going on, but it will be the big thing. And so, what I've said is actually, I don't have that much to say about the forthcoming match, but I, I was a second at two matches, which were short v Kasparov and Anand v Kasparov, and um, I am going to talk about the latter. But about what I learnt about match play, what a World Championship match entails, it's quite something. So the first thing to say is that the present match, they're very well uh, matched on paper, Nippon Nishi and Ding Niren. Um, Nippo actually has a slight plus score overall in classical chess. I haven't even bothered to check quickest speeds. But he built that up uh, basically most of a decade ago, between 2009 and 16, I think it is. And um, since then, Nippo's slightly been in the ascendant. On the other hand, uh, Nippo won the um, last decisive game in the candidates, uh, round one in Madrid. So, you know, they're quite well matched, very well matched. Um, of course, Nippo collapsed against Carlsen in the previous match. And this is potentially a serious problem because however much you try to strengthen yourself, I said to anneal his armour, but I mean, okay, whatever you do, you um, can only really test it that it's worked in real time and during battle. Nothing you do can prepare yourself fully for the moment, for doing it in the moment. It's like taking a penalty in football or something, I presume. They can practice as much as they like but in the end they have to perform they have to execute as they would say or perform or whatever they you want um now ding tends to start slowly he started badly in both candidates tournaments and that was well he had very good reason in the first one in 2020 he'd just been in quarantine in moscow and actually the second candidates tournament was the one where He'd had to play a million games in a month in China so as to have played enough games to qualify after Sergei Karyakin was excluded. And you can argue that FIDE really didn't need to make him play those games. I mean, there had been a pandemic, hadn't there? Anyway, so I don't know who's the favourite, but now I'm going to go back to the matches I was a second at. The one I was a second for Nigel, unfortunately, he got blown away in the first half dozen games. I haven't even looked to check. I know Gary was several <laughs> games up very quickly and therefore Nigel didn't really have much of a chance. Though he did draw the second half of the match which is jolly impressive. Um, and so I'm going to talk about the Anan match which was at the top of the Twin Towers in New York. I couldn't remember the year. It was 95 actually. I'm very bad about exact years. And um, this was a really very, very fierce contest until the halfway mark when Anand briefly took the lead and then Kasparov uh, took control himself. So I've given an outline, well not an outline, quite a deep, uh, quite a detailed um, account of what happened in the match. So as White, Anand got White in game one actually, and his point of attack was he was going to play E4 and just play his stuff. So he started with e4 and kept on bashing away against Kasparov's. Kasparov played the Nidorf, 
and Anne had decided to play bishop e2, so Kasparov then played e6, going into the Skaveningen, and this is something he'd played several times against Anatoly Karpov with success. Excuse me. <coughs> and, um, well, they played four of them, then in the fifth one, in game nine, Vichy managed to win, at which point he went one up, because all of the other games had been drawn. Kasparov had taken, they were playing 20 games, which matters because it gives you much more leeway as to how you attack the enemy than a shorter match. Kasparov did something quite different. He started with some reconnaissance. He played uh, d4 in the first game, and it was a Nimzo Indian, and he played queen c2. Vichy played well and drew quite easily. And then he did an English Retty type of thing. Now, what I would say is that. This is quite slow, but it's widening the bridgehead, which means that the seconds, we the second, and add seconds, there was myself, there was Arta Yusupov, who was the chief second, there was Patrick Wolf, and there was Elisba Ubilava. And, um, well, we had to analyse more things because Kasparov had widened the area of conflict, which is probably part of the reason he did this. Also, he wanted to find a target. In his third white, which is already game six, <coughs> he played e4 and played a Lopez, and Vichy played the open defence, which was his main opening against at that point, against e4. And the open is a wonderful opening, but it is... Black is making a big statement, really. He's saying, I can have a centre and development. And that's a big statement to make. It's, well, I guess it's probably true. It should be playable. But it does mean it's subject to very, very exact analysis and ways that White can try to attack it. And that is what happened. Kasparov played one of the main lines, knight g5, the thing that uh, Anatoly Karpov unleashed uh, upon Viktor Korchnoi in Baggio, it was actually a Zaitsev's idea. I couldn't remember which Zaitsev, it's actually Igor Zaitsev's idea. There was Igor and Alexander, who were both grandmasters. Anyway, Igor Zaitsev's idea, knight g5, and Vichy actually played the defence that Victor had all those years ago, and he managed to hold. It was very, very complicated, very, very fierce battle. So uh, then game eight, Kasparov is white again, he plays the uh, scotch. Um, and this is actually temporising. We didn't understand any of this really at the time. I didn't understand the meta battle until afterwards. But in retrospect, I do understand it pretty well, I think. He was temporising. And um, Vichy played a novelty in one of the main lines and drew quite easily. So we've had game nine. Which Vichy's won. Vichy's won ahead after a couple of weeks. I don't know how many games they were playing. I haven't checked the exact schedule. I could have done. Um, and he's going to be black in game 10. And the question is what to do. So Kasparov, after losing, is going to be a raging bull. Uh, you know, there are people who cover up after they've lost. I might be one of those. But there are also people who get furiously angry and, and, and just think, I'm going to kill this guy now. He's hurt me. And Kasparov, I think, was one of those, pretty clearly. And he had an idea. Now, the thing is that in the meta battle, of course, Anand had a second opening as a backup in case something went wrong with this, the open variation or in case he wanted a breast. And that was the center counter. And this was the moment when he should have played the center counter because it would have deflected Kasparov. Kasparov is sitting there with steam rising from his ears, probably only just about metaphorically. And he's about about to lunge at Anand with all guns blazing, and then he has to uh, refocus. It would have been a huge psychological blow. Uh, when Anand did finally play the centre counter in game 14, it went very well. He got the advantage, actually, early on, though, though by then he was psychologically in a bad way and Kasparov rallied and won but um, at that stage it would have been devastating uh, or quite possibly devastating 
Kasparov might have been less gung ho against it, but who knows? He might have won Anand because Kasparov would have been so derailed and the match might have been totally different. As it was, Kasparov got to play a fantastic piece of opening preparation. There was an idea of Mikhail Tars, which apparently had also appeared in some correspondence game, I think, though I didn't find the correspondence game. Um, and so Kasparov equalised. The next game, Anand still looked in great shape as white, but Kasparov then showed his brilliant sense of timing. Of course, he had just been punched in the face, or certainly, you know, in the in game game nine, and he switched to the dragon, which he never played before in public, at least not seriously. Maybe in some symbols and things, but not not in a proper game. And he was very well prepared. And Anand refused to draw. This is a difficult decision. With hindsight, I think maybe he should have realised. <coughs> Excuse me. The problem is that you don't really know how stressed you are, how shocked you are, until you react. So Vishu refused to draw, and he blundered, and he lost. And at that stage, Kasparov had won two in a row. It had been totally turned round. And um, that was really the fulcrum, is what I said, in which the pendulum swung, those three games. And there are some more. In my database, I've got them with annotations in different languages. Um, I've got some some in German as well by Vals and I, I could have rewritten them but I thought these are the three main games there's plenty of stuff to talk about so let's go to the database now and just see these three games which are here so we start with Anand Kasparov game nine uh, okay we've had we've had I suppose I ought to play the moves through I'm not going to go through these I mean I basically I left the notes more or less unchanged. I added my the odd comment by myself and some diagrams because there weren't many diagrams. I thought that those would be useful. So, of course, E5 is the alternative, but E6 is what Kasparov played in, I think, seven games against Karpov with success. And Anand had prepared this to annoy in enormous detail. Um, in this one... Okay, knight b3. Black's going to take and play bishop c6 if you don't, so you tend to do this. Um, rook d1, apparently. He's, uh, I mean, this she's written his notes there. The, 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 the relevant games at that stage were by John von der Veel. Von der Veel and, um, uh, okay, well, these notes. b4, of course, you can't take it. Queen takes rook b1. Uh, I'll just put this in. Sorry. JS. Corsa. And we'll give that two question marks. I probably ought to just mention that. B1. Okay, that's not really worth mentioning even, is it? And b5, and Vichy explains that if black doesn't exchange, then there's a, an important main line which goes bishop d6, uh, if you go bishop, bishop d7, rook to there, rook to there. Sorry, if, if rook c8, e5, Takes, 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 here, here, take, take. And white is going to get a past a pawn. Uh, you're going to be able to arrange to get a past a pawn, which is going to be definitely dangerous. At least that's the claim. So um, that's why he didn't um, play this. He took first. Um... And they got to this position. And White got some pressure. But, you know, it's not the end of the world. Played that. I'm not... Um, obviously, White has lots of control here. And he went with d5. And here, Kasparov just had to sit and take it. It's not a very pleasant position. But if he does nothing, White has to try to prove that he has 
that he can do stuff, and it's apparently not that easy. Kasparov took, though. I mean, I can see why he thought maybe bishop c7 was going to be a problem. You can see that it's there's a temptation to take the exchange, but now these pawns are going to be make a queen, and therefore you have to get some massive counterplayers black, and he nearly did. So now there is a threat of rook takes h3 check, but um, um, obviously king h2, and I ought to probably um, king h2, rook e8, d7 plus or minus it says. Queen e5, you, you just take the rook. So a brilliant game by Vichy, which as he said I was ecstatic. Needless to say the rest of the week was a cold shower. Yeah, well, I mean, the problem is, so now we get to game 10, which is the um, open Spanish. And as I said, he should have played d5. He really should have done. And I mean, I wasn't so much involved in the meta decision process. And I, I didn't understand anyway then what I understand now, how absolutely crucial it would have been uh, to play it at that particular moment. Um, so this is knight g5. The point is, as I pointed out, if here then here, king d7 is bad because of bishop d5, but castle's queen side is a main line, an absolute main line, which goes, how does it go? Queen takes, I've forgotten how, how it goes, reference. Um, And what do they normally do? Do they normally do that? Or do they normally take first? They normally go bishop b6 check first. Sorry, bishop takes c check. F takes here. Queen takes this. Queen e5. And there's five. b4. And here they go queen d5, actually. This is, this, this is the main line, a main line. Take... Take, take. Okay, notation, wait a minute, let's just promote that. Uh, C3. With an immensely, immensely complicated, complicated position. White is a piece up, but black has serious pawns, serious pawns. Okay. And, and I don't know, uh, it's interesting actually, we can just ask its sublime and glorious majesty here what it thinks. Uh, it says equal. Actually. All right. Fair enough. Okay, that, that isn't really the point. The point is, though, that that is a main line. And obviously Kasparov will have analysed this. So what happened was, that this is the one that, that Vichy had played in the previous game. And knight f3 had been played, and actually this was also played. Knight f3 was played in the Kar Karpov Korchnoi game uh, in Baggio. But in the interim, we'd actually analysed this game in huge detail. We hadn't analysed bishop c2. Um, and now this is tremendously dangerous. Paul Vichy now is facing the closest to a centaur you could get at this stage. Uh, you know, a man, machine analysis. It's certainly got Misha Tal involved. All the boys are involved. What what a fun position to analyse. At home, in a relaxed manner. What a not fun position to have during a World Championship match. In real time at the board. Um, okay. Lots and lots of analysis. Queen A1, I'll give you some Uh, 
I mean, I imagine if I give this to an engine now, it will say, well, you're not quite right, sir. But this is one of the lines. And this is this is given as plus or minus such a bad engine, I did check. Okay, so they played their moves, and this was horrific. And all this got blitzed out by Kasparov, of course. And there's nothing really to do. So if takes, of course, there's queen h5 and queen f7 mate. Vichy found the only way to fight. Well done him. Very well done just to fight at all. Um, you wouldn't play king takes because of queen h4 check. And they got to this ending. And rook c1, and these are notes by... Are they notes by Tash? It's a star move. It abruptly stops by its counterplay. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? It's a star move, but an obvious move. And white has a big advantage. Still not trivial. I mean, I would have thought that you'd have tried b3 and a3, but it is losing. And they played their moves. And it just didn't really work out. Um. And rook, rook d6 was a fine move, um, which basically sets up a mating net. And here the she resigned. Uh, yeah, and I've said something fatuous, a body, a brilliant by Yimba Kasparov and a body blow, which is true. So we go on to the next game. Vichy's expecting another Skavening, and he's done his work. He thinks he can get his plus equals, but, but he gets hit by g6. Well, what do you do? Uh, you're sitting at the board. The world champion, one of the strongest players of all time, though Vichy also is one of the strongest players, has just played a dragon for the first time in his life. What the hell do you do against it? And Vichy decided to play... He just played a main line of the Yugoslav. He played what he normally played. Okay, so bishop g5, rook c5 is was the main line at the time. I think still is. And there was a whole book in it, which I can't find at the moment. If somebody can remind me who that book's by. Uh, we actually had to... Jonathan Mestel sent us a message. He probably telephoned it being 1995 and said, there is a book on this variation which you need to have. And we had to get it sent from wherever it was. It might have been from Germany. Was it published in Germany? I don't remember. And we didn't get it for a few days. So we were actually preparing with sort of the, the sort of stuff we had, which wasn't nearly as... It either started here or it started after Bishop G5, Rook C5. And um, anyway, the alternative is King B1. And I guess Kasparov will have guessed that Vichy would probably play King B1. Because going into Bishop G5, Rook C5 cold is just not something you can do. Knight d2. The stock exchange sacrifices b5 here. And now queen a5. This was sort of a novelty now, or certainly unusual. And the important thing is that if knight d5, queen d2 takes here, have to take back with the bishop unfortunately. You have knight e4 is which actually gives black at least equality. But let's carry on a couple more moves. Um, so presumably knight takes. Do you take and take and d6? It's not taken and d6. Take. 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 Push f5. Uh, question mark. Okay, push f5. That's even better than I was hoping. How does this work? Rook takes f6, rook e2. Takes f6, rook e2. And the Martians have landed, really. Um, okay. So, so what he should do, he should do knight g3. Equals plus. Sorry, have I just... Equals plus. Okay. So that's the that's the reason you can play Queen A five. And there was some game uh, by Alexei Suetin. 
have we got the game by sweat in here? I hope we have. Uh, Bishop g7, King g7. Uh, have I got the sweating game? I thought I had. Yes, there. Were, um, I, yeah, here we are. Sabo sweating, which really didn't go well for Sabo at all. For sweating at all. For sweating Sabo, wasn't it? Disaster this was. Oh dear, not good. Yeah. This was the previous game. Okay, so they got this position, and here uh, Gary offered a draw. So, with with lashings of hindsight, it's quite clear that he should have taken it. Difficult. If you take the draw, you've admitted that your opponent has got one over you in the opening, because clearly you don't want to agree a quick draw as white. You're not happy. You're going to have to be black against the man next game, and it's going to be embarrassing a little bit. However... The question is, can you judge just how upset you were by the previous game and think, I need to reset? It's going to be, it's it's far from ideal result, but the guy has out-prepared me. It's going to happen. It's a 20-game match, not a one-game match, and I can take it. So, I don't know. I mean, I'm, a, I'm quite wussamy, and I, you know, take draws too easily anyway, and I certainly... Of course, Kasparov is much stronger than me, whereas he isn't much stronger. He wasn't so much stronger than Vichy, who's a wonderful player. And um, so, I don't know, but he didn't anyway. And they played some moves. And now this. Actually, Kasparov had got, got this wrong. He thought that knight e7, rook to here, that in this line you should go rook c8. And that's a mistake, because after c3, exclam, um, exclam, uh, this, this is at least plus of a line, yeah. It says, uh... So, yeah, there's GKs. Okay. Of course, that should play. Rook takes B4 check when he has the chance. Okay. I think I should probably promote this variation really because cause this is uh, and but Vichy I think this probably was a trap I think Kasparov realised he was setting a trap and thought this will be fun because the guy is a bit unstable at the moment I'm guessing because unfortunately he went there and went knight b6 thinking he was winning the exchange and that you know, you can imagine that after rook takes b4 check, king a3, rook c4, the game very definitely continues then. I mean, black has a good pawn for the exchange, puts his bishop in c4, and has very good drawing chances. But unfortunately, there was this horrible blow. I'm going to put a diagram here. Um, and that was... And that was that. And I think that was basically the match in some sense. Of course they played on. Uh, Vichy played the centre counter. I gather, I don't read German properly. I was doing a lesson with somebody who does, who told me that Kasparov said, oh, they shouldn't have let Vichy play the centre counter. 
against him. And of course, that was the intention all along. He didn't know this. Uh, it was actually a main line that, uh, that, 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 that was ready to be played. And it should have been played at that moment, at the one specific moment. When you're playing a match, it happens in real time. It has its own life. Um, you know, there's the opening battles, there are the middle games you want to try to reach, that's a meta question. There's the psychological interaction, who's feeling better and worse, what's happened. And there was that one moment, the moment of truth, when nobody stole anybody's wallet, uh, that's Tom Lira, but, um, that, um, but um, he needed to play the centre counter. He didn't, and he got done. So by the time the next column comes, I think it will presumably be the 16th if today, no, the 23rd will it be? No, it will be the 16th, won't it? Because today's the 2nd. So it will be the 16th and we'll be halfway through, well, a week into the World Championship. And I'll probably carry on talking about that, about the early games, what I think is going on. Uh, we'll see. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this. It's been illuminating and I'll see you in a fortnight.